good af good af oh. good afternoon good afternoon everybody can you can you hear me yes it's okay yeah please um please take a seat we'll we'll get started any minute <laughs> Please take a seat, colleagues, and, uh, and we'll, we'll start our International Day of Forests event. Okay, uh, let's get started. Uh, Rebecca Moore is going to walk in the door any minute, but we don't want to delay because we have, a, we have a packed agenda. So good afternoon, good morning. Welcome everyone to our event for International Day of Forests. We're broadcasting here from the headquarters of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations in Rome, Italy. Uh, my name is Julian Fox. I am a senior forestry officer from FAO's forestry division, and I'm also Australian. So I apologize if you cannot understand a word I say, <laughs> but, but hopefully you can. I am your master of ceremonies today, and I have one simple objective. There is a rumor that I've heard that foresters are not very innovative people. My objective today is to dispel that myth and convince you that in fact foresters are among the most innovative people you will meet. And to help me do that, we have an incredible program for the afternoon, which will go into a huge amount of details on how innovation is transforming the way we manage and monitor our forests. But without further ado, let me pass to the Director of the Forestry Division, Mr. Jimin Wu, to provide opening remarks. Jimin, over to you. Thank you, Julian. The Honorable uh, Graham Stewart, Minister of uh, Energy Security and Net Zero of the United Kingdom, will join us virtually. Uh, actually, we'll, he will have a video speech for this uh, event. And Ms. Rebecca Moore, the Director of uh, the Google Earth Engine, is on her, on her way uh, to this uh, meeting room and distinguished participants in person and online. Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to all of you for this hybrid event to celebrate International Day of Forest 2024. So the theme for IDF 24 is forest and innovation, new solutions for a better world. So the theme was chosen to highlight how the joint efforts to address global forest challenges require innovative solutions. So I used to say that with 100 million hectares lost annually to deforestation, 35 million damaged by insect pests and diseases, and up to approximately 70 million hectares, say, burned by wildfires, new and innovative solutions are essential. So the role of innovation is well recognized by FAO Forestry in its new roadmap from Vision to Action 2431. The forestry roadmap, which will be launched during COPO 27 in July, outlines a new area of conservation, restoration, sustainable production while leaving no one behind. I'm delighted that we are joined virtually by the Minister of uh, Energy Security and Net Zero from the United Kingdom, the Right Honourable uh, Graham Stewart. The UK is actually a very important collaborator partner of uh, uh, FAO, especially in the field of forestry, particularly with respect to the new program, Accelerating Innovative Monitoring for Forests. So it's now uh, say, uh, under the uh, leadership of uh, Julian Fox, and it is called Aim for Forests. So this five-year program is closely aligned to today's theme, and I'm sure that we'll hear more about it during the uh, discussions. So today we are in the midst of a forest data revolution driven by innovation and technology. FAO Forestry has been a proud pioneer in this space. By developing the Open Forest Initiative, it is the first open source project at FAO, over 200,000 people from 196 countries have been helped to improve their forest data. Open Forest 
is now used by 90% of the forest submissions to UNFCCC. I think it's 90 out of 90% out of 63 countries are using this uh, FU uh, open forest data platform. And the improved forest data is resulting in positive actions on the ground. Much of this technological innovation has evolved through partner partnership, such as that with uh, Google. So I'm uh, also delighted that uh, Rebecca Moore, the director of uh, Google Earth Engine, is with us today. And in signing a new MOU between Google Engine and uh, FAO, we are scaling up our partnership and uh, cementing, cementing it for years to come, as well as strive to meet the SDGs. We reach a further milestone today in the launch of a new next generation uh, mo uh, mobile application under the Open Forest banner called Ground, which has been jointly developed over the past two years by FEO and Google. This app has been specifically designed to empower indigenous uh, peoples, smallholders, local and local communities in the actions on the ground. So colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, as we acknowledge our progress and benefits of this data revolution, we must also recognize how much work we still have to do. There is a need to scale up innovation to hold deforestation and catalyze progress under the UN Decade for Ecosystem Restoration. We must develop early warning system for fires and also continue to empower indigenous peoples as forest custodians. Enhancing the role of wood and forest products is also very key. So by increasing the development of materials derived from forests and trees, we can substitute plastics, building materials, fabrics, medicines, and many other everyday items with sustainable forest products. And FAO is uh, steadfast in this support. Innovation is at the heart of this support to develop new solutions for a better world. So I hope you engage fully in these sessions, which in turn will produce concrete results towards our shared goals. Thank you. Over to you, Julia. Thank you very much, Jimin, for those really inspiring and encouraging words. We now have a video message from the Right Honourable Graham Stewart, the Minister for Energy Security and Net Zero from the United Kingdom. Thank you. Hello and happy International Day of Forests. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person, but I still wanted to send this message. As the UK's Minister for Energy Security and Net Zero, I'm determined the UK continues its support for the protection of forests. At COP28, I was pleased to see how prominent forests were in the negotiations, as indeed they should be. And earlier this month, I attended the Forest, Agriculture and Commodities Trade Forum in Bali. As co-chair of the discussions, I heard from delegates about the changes they're making to ensure the production of commodities like palm oil and chocolate uh, doesn't come at the expense of forests. In fact, I didn't just hear about it, I saw it with my own eyes. I was able to visit the Wanagiri forest where they produce sustainable coffee, and I was particularly impressed by their tree adopter program, which protects the forest while adding to the local economy. And I'm pleased to say I'm now the very proud sponsor of an adopted tree. To me, it's a reminder that stopping deforestation requires global coordination, just as you're doing today. But smaller actions, one tree at a time, can also make a real difference for local communities. Our forests are a legacy of our past, but also a key to our future. Because there's no pathway to the 1.5 degree Paris target without urgently halting global deforestation. Now that's why the UK has provided £24.5 million to establish AIM for forests. And we're proud to work with the UN, FAO and other organisations on the programme. Since its launch one year ago, AIM for Forests 
is already supporting 11 countries. And by harnessing our world-leading universities and research organizations to deliver tools and data that can help protect forests. We've got in-person workshops and certified e-learning courses which have already reached more than 1,200 people. And about 40% of those attendees were women and more than 100 were from indigenous peoples or members of local communities to the forest concerned. And today, I'm delighted to announce that we're committing a further £6 million for the Zambia Integrated Forest Landscape Programme. This funding will help them to expand climate smart agriculture practices so they can tackle drivers of deforestation. The UK is proud to share its innovative technology and provide climate finance to projects that need it so that together we can end deforestation. And I'm certain that today your discussions will help us reach this important goal. Thank you. Many thanks to the Minister for the encouraging words and, uh, and to the UK for the continuous support. We would now like to launch the International Day of Forests video. If we can play the video, please. Thank you. Forests are one of the planet's greatest resources, but climate change and human impact pose growing threats. Thanks to cutting edge advances in technology, new tools are making it possible to address these challenges. One of the front lines for forest innovation is here in Papua New Guinea, which is home to the world's third largest rainforest and 7% of global biodiversity. In this Pacific Island nation, 97% of the land is under customary ownership. This means it belongs to the people. Papua New Guinea's indigenous peoples are now using advanced technology to monitor their forests. We are in the midst of a forest data revolution and the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations is at the forefront of this. Here in Papua New Guinea, we are supporting the government and local communities to collect new data to boost their efforts to protect, restore and sustainably use forests. Elsewhere, remote sensing and monitoring is also helping to fight fires, one of the main threats to forests, by creating early warning systems and reducing fire risk. But innovation is not just changing the way we monitor forests. Innovation is also pushing the boundaries of what we can do with wood and forest products. By 2030, we will have to house an additional 3 billion people. But the construction sector alone is responsible for approximately 37% of energy and process-related greenhouse gas emissions. We do need to try and find a better way to build housing. And this is where mass timber comes into play. It reduces the carbon footprint of buildings and it stores carbon for its lifetime. And this can make wood-based construction almost an extension of our forests. And the list of new applications is constantly growing, from packaging to cosmetics. State-of-the-art wood-based products are also being used in medicine. For example, in casts, biodegradable medical equipment, and even antimicrobial creams. And they are also starting to increase sustainability in the clothing and fashion industry, with around 60% of all textiles currently estimated to be plastic-based. People really want to know what their clothes are made of and choose better, more responsible uh, options. I think using wood-based materials could be a game changer. I can see so many possibilities that these kind of materials can bring to the fashion industry. And it's super exciting to be part of it. From new ways to monitor and protect our forests to breakthroughs paving the way for greater sustainability, forest innovations are set to play a key role in tackling global challenges for our planet. Thank you very much. That was, that was amazing. We're actually just, uh, Rebecca Moore is walking here from her hotel and uh, we're monitoring it, but she should walk in any, any second. So I will, uh, oh, she's on the way. Perfect timing. 
So maybe we'll just pause for one minute while Rebecca approaches the room, an uh, eagerly awaited moment. And, uh, Nothing like keeping us suspenseful, suspenseful for on a day like today. And here she is, Rebecca Moore. <laughs> it is now with great pleasure that I introduce Rebecca Moore, the founder and director of Google Earth Outreach and Google Earth Engine. Rebecca, please come straight to the podium. <laughs> Rebecca will provide remarks and help us launch a new addition to FAO's Open Forest family, Open Forest Ground. Over to you, Rebecca. <laughs> Fantastic, perfect entry. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hopefully worth waiting for. This is perfect. Good afternoon, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here representing Google and the Google Earth team. Uh, we have, let me back up here. Yes, we're going to talk about turning pixels into knowledge in action through technology innovation and partnerships. And yes, our informal partnership began with FAO in 2010 when we made the first visit and began having our staff meet with FAO staff. And then we developed conviction that there was definitely a very strong partnership to be held between Google and FAO. FAO with working directly with all the countries, driving impact on the ground, and Google providing technology innovation. And so I was actually here in 2016 when we presented the partnership. And at that time, we had a conundrum. FAO and Google, should we call it GAO? Or should we call it FUGL? And we never made a decision on that. Uh, but the good news is the more material, important things manifested in terms of a lot of progress uh, together. And we're going to speak about that, a little bit of historical and then looking forward. So this is not a news flash for people, but you know we do face an urgent crisis. The force of the world and much of the planet is changing dramatically in ways that are observable from space. Um, we're hitting these planetary tipping points where former healthy carbon sinks are becoming carbon sources like parts of the Amazon. And I mean, the good news is there is now a tremendous amount of public open free near real time high resolution, you know, optical radar, all kinds of incredible data that is available to help us understand what's happening, create transparency, and you know, drive action, turning pixels into actionable information. But it's just, it was very, very difficult for any normal institution to do that, given the scale of the data. So uh, that motivated us as Google to employ the power of the Google Cloud. And we built a platform called Google Earth Engine that we announced at COP16. Um, and it brings together, it was the first cloud native planetary scale geospatial analytics platform with a you know, data catalog updating every 15 minutes, co-located with massive computational resources and a really growing, thriving ecosystem of users. So again, the innovation was connecting all of this data coming in, hosting it with an analysis ready form uh, with processor uh, capability. And again, many of you are probably very familiar with this, but the first, when we first launched Earth Engine, there was kind of a skepticism, like what is this Google thing and why do we think it should work? Uh, and I have to credit Matt Hansen of University of Maryland who kicked the tires a little bit and he was like, okay, let's give it a try to do 
you know, the first Landsat scale, uh, i.e. high resolution map of forest cover and change. That came out in 2013. It was a million hours of computation, but because we ran it on 10,000 computers in parallel, we had the result in a few days as opposed to 15 years, which is what it would have taken on a single computer. So then people began to go, okay, maybe there's something here with this cloud-powered remote sensing. The tremendous partnership with WRI on Global Forest Watch, uh, these near real-time alerts, uh, also powered by Matt Hansen's lab, are publishing live in Forest Watch for action to be taken. Um, they have done some really good work recently around um, documenting uh, and providing evidence of the impact of Forest Watch. Um, and, you know, there's been a lot of uptake by indigenous communities with a lot of successes in reducing deforestation. So Earth Engine um, really has emerged as a very powerful platform for sustainability, um, both science and operational decision making tools like Global Forest Watch, the projects with UNFAO that we're going to talk about, and then private sector using it as a tool to meet their commitments around sustainable supply chain. So we'll talk about that a bit more. Here's an example of a fantastic application built by FAO in the days when we were still trying to figure out if it was Gao or Fugel. But meanwhile, people like Eric Lindquist and Ansi and folks went to work and they created this fantastic tool called CEPL that is helping countries uh, understand, monitor, measure uh, their forests and provide um, documentation for uh, UN Red or Red, Red Plus support. And this is just like one image, uh, you know, again, powered by Earth Engine that I find interesting because it's using the power of Earth Engine to look at the pattern of a pixel when deforestation happens over time or when degradation happens. Um, so that's for the nerds. Um, so, but backing away from nerds to, hey Eric, uh, to, you know, what this is all about at the end of the day, we've been really excited to see, and this is new information that has not, we have not talked about publicly until today, and only because through the deep partnership with FAO, there's extensive documentation and evidence of, of this point that a number of countries going back over the past 10 years or so have used Earth Engine and the FAO tools powered by Earth Engine to avoid almost 100 megatons of forest related carbon, 95 megatons. And if anyone wants to know the gory details on that number, which I'm sure some of you will, we have a blog post coming out today that speaks more about that. Um, Restoration, of course, is critical alongside avoiding deforestation. I know Tom Crowther is here, and I'm excited about the panel he's going to be leading. Um, his team used Earth Engine to do the first high resolution study of uh, suitability for restoration, looking at every hectare on the planet. That was published in Science and then updated recently in Nature confirming their findings. And again, I don't want to say too much more about it because he's here and he can speak more authoritatively. But what we've been excited to see is the first powering the science and then powering an operational application that's being used by more than 100,000 projects around the ground to plan and execute, implement restoration projects. I think it is the biggest, most successful platform right now for restoration. And they're measuring all kinds of, you know, co-benefits of that, such as carbon emission reduction. Um, all right, the, the last area is, all right, we all care about forests here in this room. Um, if you want to understand what's happening to forests, you have to understand the drivers of deforestation, which often relate to conversion of forests for agriculture, or I've learned recently aquaculture, mangroves being converted for aquaculture. And so you really have to have a holistic understanding of these other land use areas and how they're changing. 
um, and especially in the context of something like EUDR and uh, sustainable supply chain commitments that are being made. So Unilever is, is uh, one of our uh, partners or customers on Earth Engine, and they're doing really interesting stuff with modeling the sort of mill catchment area uh, of, for oil palm in uh, Indonesia. But again, they, like many other private sector and NGO, they needed better data uh, uh, to really execute on these commitments. So what I'm super excited. Uh, some of you may have heard about this, the Forest Data Partnership, uh, which was initially, I think, conceived by USAID, and they somehow wrangled a bunch of us to across uh, sectors to come together and attempt to address the gaps in knowledge and data that exist. Uh, this was predating UDR, but that, that uh, have created complexity for sustainable sourcing commitments and zero deforestation commitments to be met by companies. So we formed this. Um, we're kind of the tech arm of it, but you've got WRI, NASA Severe, Unilever, W, uh, I mentioned WRI, and of course, FAO has been a very strong partner in this. And there's a little bit of eye chart here, but the two main areas that Forest Data Partnership, and you're gonna hear more about this today, that Forest Data Partnership is focusing on is first, like, because we have essentially all the sectors represented among the membership, and we do invite more members um, engaging and aligning with partners across these sectors to you know, set up a governance structure, to engage with the organizations that uh, need this information and may also participate in supplying information, and then deploying uh, the data layers that, that we are producing. And then on the accelerating innovation side, which is more where Google's leaning in, there's you know, there are not good maps or masks of the seven EUDR regulated commodities, uh, such as palm, you know, cocoa, rubber, coffee, and so on. They just don't exist. And so we, uh, we are leaning in as Google on uh, producing those using machine learning and AI, but very much collaboratively with FAO and other members of the FDAP. We're doing this for the FDAP, and we expect it to be an iterative process. But the first, the first model is already out, which is Palm, um, and then we'll be, we'll be doing the others. And then we have a ground, uh, a field data collection tool that we're also going to share today. So just zooming in, um, you can, you'll see the first product of the Forest Data Partnership, which is, we're, we're looking at uh, South Sumatra. Uh, zooming in, here's, you can see imagery. And here is our map of, current version V1 map of palm, uh, probability of palm in 2023. And then this is the probability of palm in 2020. Um, this is all uh, available now, launched for people to view, interact with. And there's a, uh, if you want to get even more engaged, there's a link for you to participate in terms of providing feedback, maybe providing data, because we want this to be a community-led uh, uh, project. Everything's open public open free. Um, the last area, uh, if they don't hook me off the stage, is in going through this work over all these years together with FAO, we've learned a lot about what gaps are, and we're filling those gaps. And one of them is really that there hasn't been enough meaningful engagement and participation of local and indigenous communities. Um, who often are the experts on what's happening on their lands or adjacent lands, uh, but they haven't had the 
tooling and engagement to um, meaningfully participate in many cases. And meanwhile, NGOs and governments and private sector organizations all also need ground-based data, field data, uh, to inform understanding what's happening, validate models, and so on. But they are they are just tremendous challenges around that. So today, with FAO, we're announcing a new tool uh, that will be part of the legendary, I would say, FAO open source suite called Open Forest uh, that today has tools like Collect Earth. Um, this will join that as an open source tool called Ground. Our goal is to democratize mapping and field data collection at scale. Uh, there's a link there if you want to learn more about it. Um, but just imagine that it's a native Android app with a web-based side for dispatching and organizing the tasks that will happen in the field. Um, it contains uh, very good resolution imagery globally um, that has come from Google Earth and in some cases produced by Earth Engine. You can run in offline mode. Um, and then there are various um, tools for drawing, annotating, capturing information, and so on. And there's, I think you're going to learn more about it today, but one of our real goals is to enable smallholder farmers and communities to be able to collect information, submit it easily to engage with cloud um, computation, creation of derivative information, and connecting them to markets uh, in a meaningful way. Uh, this is uh, some field trials uh, that have gone on with ground. So with that kind of whirlwind tour, um, I did want to say that we really, as Google, tremendously value the partnership with FAO. I feel that it brings together very complementary strengths that is uh, creating benefit for countries, communities, uh, people around the world. So thank you. Yes, we have a special thing happening now. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rebecca. That was worth the wait, although I did have five heart attacks while I was uh, <laughs> waiting for you. So yeah, we have a very special moment, in fact. We, we, are, we are signing into, into implementation a new memorandum of understanding between FAO and Google. It will run for the next four years and marks a significant scaling up of our collaboration to accelerate technical innovation for the implementation of FAO's strategic framework and the agenda of the Sustainable Development Goals. So I have a, a beautiful document here and a beautiful pen, and it'll be a great photo opportunity, but Jimin and Rebecca will sign the MOU. One moment. <laughs> Wonderful. What a, what a great moment. And I think we're off to a great start. And now, thank you so much, Rebecca. Thank you, Jimin.